تفضل دكتور السلام عليكم ايفرون I'll try to, over the next 15 minutes, without coughing, uh, I'll try to talk about some of the emerging technologies in arrhythmia mapping and ablation. There is a lot of technologies going around because there is, like, literally, the government, the, most of the companies are more invested in procedures because there are more monies in procedures. No one cares about drugs anymore. But I, I try to cherry pick some of the technologies that I think will have future in the way that we manage our arrhythmia patients. So I have no disclosures that's relevant to this talk. So I have two objectives that I'll try to cover over the next 15 minutes. So I wanna talk, I just wanna review one technology that may help us in arrhythmia mapping. So I wanna review the value of integrating cardiac imaging in guiding ventricular tachycardia ablation. And I don't think that I can talk about a new technology without bringing the role of the new kid, the, the, uh, the new kid in the market uh, with pulse field ablation in managing uh, atrial fibrillation. So uh, starting by looking at imaging to guide VT ablation. So ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation are common. About half a, half a million deaths in the US happens per year due to ventricular arrhythmia. I see these are are like is the treatment for preventing and reducing the risk of sudden death in the high-risk groups. But still implanting, I always say that implanting ICD will prevent sudden death, but it will not prevent arrhythmias. Because if the patient have the substrate, they will always have with arrhythmias that will require treatment from the device. And this will lead to ICD discharge that, lead, that, has, been relay, that has been correlated towards survival worse quality of life and significant psychological impact, impairment. And we have many patients after like 20 or 30 shocks will come and beg us to take the device out. And they forgot that the device probably saved their life. So, and we know that VT ablation so far, I think the evidence is very conclusive when it comes to ischemic cardiomyopathy. So if a patient is already on amiodarone and they come with repeated ventricular arrhythmia and with ischemic cardiomyopathy, we know that ablation is better than adding, like adding mexelatine or like other or procanamide uh, when it, we're looking at their arrhythmia recurrence. And most, it's mostly driven by preventing further ventricular arrhythmias and VT storms. And, and with the improvement in the technology, people are pushing the edge for, or the threshold of doing VT ablations to even having like one shock is enough to get to go to the to go to the table for a VT ablation, and uh, like a few weeks ago, one of the centers from the U.S. Like one of the one of the speakers was from a center in the U.S. is a high volume center. They do three VTs a day because I think their threshold of taking someone to the lab is very low because I think they're good at what they do. But like this is where the trend is moving. We're going to take more and more patients for VT ablations. But if you can see, even for those who had VT ablation. Like the, 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 the primary event in the form of death, VT storm, or, or like or further VTs, even for those who received ablation, is, I have to say, it's quite dismal. So like in two to three years, like the majority of the patients are either dead or having like further arrhythmias. That speaks of how fragile our patients are and how limited our understanding of the substrate for the VT is. So to reach a better outcome, so we have to understand the arrhythmia circuit and try to ablate it. And this is, uh, uh, like, so this is like the original description. I think it's more of a simplistic description of the re-entry circuit of the ventricular tachycardia. So usually you have like this area of slow conduction, what we call the isthmus, where the tachycardia, like uh, uh, where the tachycardia, uh, like where the, imp where the impulse propagate at a slow speed. Well, like, and then it breaks out here and like, and it gives you like the QRS morphology and then comes back to the other end of the isthmus. So like you will have like this, a circuit, like, or uh, uh, like a circuit or like, or a re-entry form of tachycardia. Uh, uh, so like you, so if you can identify this isthmus and ablate it, you will most likely terminate the tachycardia and prevent the propagation or the current from turning around. So, and if we look at histology, this is how this isthmus or the narrow, or the narrow circuit or the, or the narrow track is. Like this is an area of scarred myocardium, another area of scarred myocardium. And then you have an island of this, like not fully dead, like an, that will have like a slow conduction 
through. So this is like where the isthmus is uh, looking at histology. And this is how we see it in the EP lab. This like it has like this very fractionated signal. This is where the isthmus is, and this is where you want to target your ablation. And if we look at this isthmus or the circuit, when they did mapping of the endocardium versus the epicardium of the heart, this like circuit or the isthmus is quite complex. It's a 3D. It goes through the full thickness from the endocardium to the epicardium. So, and also like this is also has been seen in patients with ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. So there, there is a 3D nature of this uh, like isthmus or the narrow track in patients with ventricular tachycardia. So how can we further define this? So, and I think through integrating images. So if we, most of, I think MRI is more or less safe in patients with implantable cardiac devices. So this is a company based in Spain. So they don't sell the software. So you just like send them the images, they will process the images and they send it back to you. With this 3D model, what they rely on is the pixel density of the MRI and they can create this 3D model of the heart showing you the scar from the endocardium to the mid of the heart through like nine layers throughout the thickness of the myocardium. And you can see like this is the area like of the dense scar, this is the area of the healthy myocardium and these are like the area between 40 to 60 is where you expect your isthmus is. And, and so as I mentioned, like they can do it both for atrial and ventricular, and you can see it can show you like exactly where the track is, where the isthmus is, where you can target your ablation even before starting the procedure. And uh, uh, like, and you can do like a, a like a, a, exactly when they send it, when they send it to the uh, center, they can show you like where the possible corridors where the tachycardia are coming from. And uh, what they do too, uh, like you can actually change the thickness going from the endocardium to the epicardium. You can see like the 3D, the 3D uh, reconstruction of like of this uh, narrow track or isthmus that you can target with your ablation even before starting your procedure. So how is, and also like it correlates very well with the EP lab. When, like what we do in the EP lab, we put our mapping catheter, and based on the voltage that we get, we get an estimate of this is a healthy myocardium. Like, so the healthy myocardium here is blue, the healthy myocardium, oh sorry. The healthy myocardium is here, like is more of a purple. And like, and here like we have an area of like of slow conduction. We can find this area of slow conduction with the different colors. This is an area of scar correlated to another area of scar here. So it actually correlates very well to what we see in the EP lab. And if our target is to find these narrow channels, like or the small signals, and if we can find them all from before starting the case, and start the case targeting all of these small potentials, we can actually reach like a decent outcome. So this is like there is like still ongoing randomized controlled trials where they actually looking into the value of doing this 3D reconstruction before every case. But like in this study, I think they have 20% of their patients where they have the CT or the MRI based reconstruction of the scar. And they went in and they eliminated all of these small channels and they actually reached decent outcomes when it comes to VT recurrence. I know it's a small study, but like it's probably like a step further on reaching better outcome and managing our VT patients. And this is like another case where a patient have septal ventricular tachycardia. They did the CT. And, the, and, the, like, and they did the, the MRI reconstruction, and the MRI proposed some epicardial channels in yellow and endocardial channels in white. So what they did, they did endocardial ablation for the channels through the, uh, uh, through, uh, at the distal aspect of the LV, but they could not ablate in the endocardium just below the valve because that would put the patient at the risk of heart block. So how they could target the epicardial aspect, they went through the cusp and they ablated the epicardial aspect of the septum through the cusp, and the VT was not inducible. Uh, so with this procedure, they minimize the risk of pacing need by avoiding ablating endocardially to reach the epicardial aspect, and also they, ev they avoided the epicardial, aspect, the epicardial puncture. So in conclusion, in ventricular tachycardia ablation, pre-procedural imaging processing can provide us with an edge in managing difficult substrate in fragile VT patient. So, now, this, uh, the second half of my talk, I just want to talk about 
arrhythmia ablation, and uh, I have to talk about pulse field. It's like it's the it's the uh, it's the it's the hot topic uh, in uh, like uh, like everyone is talks about talks about pulse field ablation in EP. So we know AFib ablation is the most common arrhythmia. Prevalence is expected to rise as the population ages further, and ablation is an effective strategy. It improves symptoms and quality of life. Oh. Sorry, there's a typo. In patients with refractory medical therapy, and it improves survival if patients have heart failure with excellent safety profile that is similar to antiarrhythmic medications. So, and we started with pulmonary vein isolation in the, 19, uh, in the late 1990s by the Purdo group. Uh, most of the, the original paper, most of the AFib triggers were from the pulmonary veins. So, when they isolated the pulmonary veins, then uh, they reach actually like a 60% of 60% uh, AFib free, even like in those days where they did AFib ablation, like using X-rays. So this is what we aim for when we do AFib ablation. We are actually iced for most of the paroxysmal. That's what all the AP society agrees on. That PVAs is probably like your step one in managing AFibs. So we try to isolate the veins like uh, uh, through ablation. And the way that we do it, and we have been doing it since the start, is through using thermal energy. Either that we use radio frequency with resistive heating, with a catheter doing point-by-point -point ablation, and we also use cryoablation with freezing. So it's purely thermal energy. So, and when we look at the efficacy, they are more or less equal. So uh, this is like a fire and ice study, and this is like the circa dose. So looking at the one year, we reach about 65 to 70% free of symptomatic AFib when we use a thermal energy. So, but we have to remember that LA anatomy is quite complex. So even though that we're using these thermal energies acutely, the left atrium like is a very complex structure. So like a, a, 30 watt, a 40 watt lesion here may be okay, but like it could be like it could be dangerous at this area because like the wall is quite thin, and also like if we look at the uh, RF ablation lesions, like they are like even like if you deliver a lesion here, like you uh, you may actually kill the tissue, but there are some areas like of healthy tissue that could be dormant areas for reconnection and AFib recurrence. So, and the main concern to me when it comes to thermal energy is collateral damage. So there is like the esophagus, which is the scariest part when we do our procedure, and also there is the phrenic nerve with both, with radio frequency and cryoablation. So people have went to extreme measures to try to protect the esophagus with this honking tube just to move the esophagus away where we deliver our lesions. And why we do this? Because we don't want to cause this atriosophageal fistula. It's a very rare complication, but like it's an absolute disaster to the patient. So AFib will never kill, but this is the mortality rate when it comes to atriosophageal fistula is close to 30%. So I would never forget, I have seen two in training. Inshallah, I will never see anyone more. So this is a patient that we did AFib ablation. Patient like lived like in the rural areas, came in with pneumonia a few weeks after. And this is the chest x-ray and someone missed like an area in the mediastinum. And the patient came in like on death door, severely septic, with an air in the mediastinum, a large pericardial effusion. He had a huge fistula, uh, but like the, it was too late. The patient was in severe sepsis, and he died in the ICU a few days after. This is I saw this, this like I saw a similar case in like in the early 2010. A patient have an AFib uh, ablation. A few days after she came in, uh, I think a few weeks after she came in with a stroke, was air embolism from atriosophageal fistula, and the patient died. So it's a no joke. So for us, we have been looking for an energy source that has no collateral damage and have a comparable efficacy to uh, thermal energy. And the answer was there since the early uh, to, to the late 80s. So in those days, what they did, so they put a catheter inside the heart, they hook it up to the DFib, and they deliver like 160 joules to the tip of the catheter. It's almost like a DC shock inside the heart and they used to call it electroporation. And that's our, like, uh, and at that time it worked very well, but like it caused like more of a mini explosion inside the heart. And with thermal energy, uh, like with, a th with, a, with, a thermal, uh, with thermal energy on, coming on in the early, two, in the early uh, 1990s, so this uh, uh, fallen off uh, favor. But like it has been a recent interest like with the pulse field ablation in the last, uh, in the last few years. Uh, two more minutes, if you don't mind. 
Yeah. So, so literally, the pulse field ablation simply is like delivering a shock to the tissue that will make the tissue more permeable, uh, where the sodium can leak in and the cell will die. And like, and the companies have their own recipe. So they have like this, uh, like a more of a, a, a like a recipe that's. Uh, enough that no one want to talk about what's the, what's the best recipe of energy, the duration, biphasic, monophasic. So you just want to keep it uh, till they make the money out of the research. But like, I think the, 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 most, uh, the most widely used or like, uh, uh, is like the, the system of photopulse called by, by, uh, by uh, Boston Scientific, where they actually like, they have like this more of a, a, a basket and a flower uh, system that delivers like Two second energy to the vein, like we'll just like you go with the um, uh, with the flower uh, with the basket form. You deliver an, a two two seconds, then rotate another two seconds, and then you go to the flower. Uh, this will create more of a uh, of a homogeneous uh, uh, delivery of this uh, of the energy throughout the pulmonary vein, and it's actually like leaves like two very discrete lesions that is not dependent on contact like RF. Uh, and like it gives like very durable pulmonary vein isolation results with almost 100% isolation at the end of the case. The efficacy of freedom of AFib, it's similar or even better to what we, with the thermal energy, 70 to 80%. And this is like the, P, the other PFA system by Medtronic was just recently published. And again, we're talking about 80% uh, 80 uh, chance of not having a symptomatic AFib at the one year and the, the beauty of it, it's like it's very tissue selective. So this is a tissue that is already ablated by PFA. You can see the blood vessels intact. You can see the nerve intact. And this is like a, a porcelain model where they actually deliberately del deliver our PFA lesions on the esophagus and nothing happened. And this is the safety profile, which is excellent. And I think everyone is looking at the atriosophageal fistula. It's like it's close to zero. And even when they did the MRI study, uh, they actually looked into areas where they have been contact with the PFA catheters on the esophagus. This is from the Bordeaux group. When they look into cryoablation, there is like enhancement at the esophagus at three months. With the RFA, there is an enhancement at the esophagus, but with the PFA, you can see enhancement on the aorta, but the esophagus like, is very resistant to PFA, which is an excellent safety profile. And if you're talking about efficacy, this is the pulmonary vein signal, and look what happens with a single application of PFA. This is like a PFA, like, and the signal is completely gone. So this is how quick, it's, a, it's kind of a cheat code for video game. Like it just like, it, it's so effective. So uh, I think for, uh, hopefully, uh, sorry for taking too long, but uh, uh, so ventricular tachycardia ablation, pre-procedural imaging can help us. And pulse field ablation, I think, have revo revolutionized the way that we treat atrial arrhythmia. And I think it will replace thermal uh, energy uh, in managing atrial fibrillation, probably other arrhythmias. Uh, thank you so much.